Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Good afternoon, Howard Wig, Code Green, Think Tech Hawaii. Have we got an unusual show for you today? It's jokingly titled, Can Libertarianism Save the World or at least Achieve 100% Clean Energy for Hawaii? And that's kind of a, a, a lead on type of title because my guest, David Jung, is not a pure libertarian. We'll, we'll get into what sort of libertarian he might be, but he's got very, very, very innovative ideas about our path to clean energy. So hearty, hearty, hearty welcome, uh, David. And uh, he's much green. Well, actually, I walk here simply because my office is nearby, but David actually kind of ironically, here you are a cab driver and you bicycled <laughs> all the way here. So welcome, David, and let's launch right in to clean energy for transportation. No normally, I have a real techie type energy efficiency in buildings thing, so this, this is different. So you and I were discussing the fact that, is it, no, Uber has acquired Lime. That's correct. And yeah, why don't you t tell us that story and, and the last mile imp implications for this? Yeah. Well, I was uh, explaining to you, or my thought, that uh, mm -hmm. we live in interesting times, mm -hmm. uh, that we have so many opportunities. And just today, Uber um, acquired Lime electric scooter, you know, which was recently uh, banned from Honolulu. Yeah, because they came in without a license and they were on the uh, sidewalks of Waikiki. And, That's yeah, correct. Yeah. And um, well, Uber did too, but they're still mm -hmm. here. <laughs> uh, but but I think it's uh, interesting um, that a company like Uber, which is worth billions of dollars, is willing to back a s relatively small. Um, uh, operation or, or a company. Mm -hmm. uh, they invested $350 million, uh, they along with Google. And I think that represents um, the future, you know, that they mm -hmm. recognize uh, how important um, e-scooters can be to uh, being part of our multimodality to, to mm -hmm. help us achieve that sustainability uh, goals that we have as a mm -hmm. community. Yeah, well, one, one thing that immediately I think of is that the millennials, people born, what, after 1995 or whatever, mm -hmm. are not attracted to cars. The mm -hmm. car ownership among that generation is going down, down, down. So they are looking for alternate means of transportation. So this is a maybe a very interesting segue here. Yeah, I, 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 the, my daughter is a millennial. Mm -hmm. And so I'm uh, acutely aware of their uh, the good things and the bad things of you know millennials, mm -hmm. um, at least from a baby boomer generation's perspective. And you're absolutely right. You know they are um, the one thing that I really uh, uh, admire about them is, and this kind of segues into the libertarianism mm -hmm. part uh, of the show, and that is they're incredibly practical. They're not pigeonholed to a certain way of thinking. You know, when I graduated, it was very important what job you get, mm -hmm. what car you drove, which apart, what neighborhood you lived in. Mm -hmm. All those things were very important. To the millennials, that seems irrelevant. Uh, it, their main thing is what's practical. You know, I don't mind living with my mom and dad because they feed me and mm -hmm. you know, I can tolerate them. I've tolerated them for 18 years before I went off to college. And, so. and they somehow tolerate me. So. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and so what, what's, what's the big deal? You know, mm -hmm. I save so much money. So whereas in my generation, no, 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 it's just yeah. the principle of the thing. Yeah. You don't go back home, yeah, right? Yeah, you're, you're a real man. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, and own. so yeah. they, they don't, they don't uh, subscribe to those things. So mm -hmm. even car ownership is the same thing, right? Why would I uh, spend you know, hundreds of dollars a month on maintaining a car and then uh, you know, uh, paying for parking and so on when and I can- insurance. And insurance, yeah. mm -hmm. I mean, the upkeep of a car, not. I don't own a personal car, mm -hmm. so but I have uh, most of my life, mm -hmm. and the amount of money that I'm saving 
is is shocking. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know the uh, of course you know before when I, before I um, became wiser, my last car was a Range Rover, so that mm -hmm. sucked up a lot of gas, mm -hmm. and um, you know takes up a lot of parking space. The insurance mm -hmm. is higher because it's a larger vehicle. And, and this is Honolulu. We are just a little bit undercrowded inside. Yeah, right, right, yeah, right, right. Yeah. But it was more of the status thing, right? Mm -hmm. You know, a Range Rover or Porsche or whatever the case may be. My daughter doesn't think that way. She drives a Mini Cooper, um, and that's at the encouragement of her mom, because if my daughter had it her way, she'd just have some beater that she'd be driving around. But my mm -hmm. mom, you know, my her mom is a little bit more okay. We've got an image to maintain mm -hmm. or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but so that, that's a wonderful thing, and that's another opportunity, along with the advancement of technology, is the evolving uh, attitude. And, you know, um, it's sad to say, but it's a younger generation, I think, that is showing a greater attitude towards, um, you know, the future and how we can achieve mm -hmm. sustainability. And, and they've been raised from a very early age, probably, with their parents' encouragement to be very, very environmentally uh, conscious. Yeah, and again, that goes sort of to my side. Uh, you know, I, I told you one time that I'm a libertarian conservationist mm -hmm. and um, that the for the Millennials conservation seems so important and there is a distinction between environmental and conservate mm -hmm. environmentalists and conservationists and again my daughter she's not into oh I want to be a ve 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 vegan for mm -hmm. a certain reason mm -hmm. or whatever it is just that daddy why why do I want to waste yeah. Right? It's, it's just yeah. conservation. Back to the practical. Yeah, back yeah. to the practical. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, for that reason, I, mean, I, I just love talking to millennials. They are uh, very refreshing from the, the I want to say that baby end of the baby boomer generation. Even within the baby boomer generation, it's different, right? I mean, we've got the last, I'm, I'm in, I was born in 62, so I'm at the last end of that. Mm -hmm. And we're heavily influenced by, uh, you know, Reagan. Uh, which was during my formative years, if you will, politically mm -hmm. formative, uh, political formative years, had the biggest influence on our generation. And, um, you know, uh, along with that came materialism, right? Mm -hmm. In the 1980s and 1990s, oh, yeah. it's all about what you wore, what you... And I think that may be that the, the reason baby boomer generation is that, is that every generation rebels from its previous mm -hmm. generation. Mm -hmm. And my generation showed so much of that materialism yeah. and the, the need to have. And mm -hmm. so the, my daughter's generation is, I think, rebelling against that. Is that, no, I don't want to be like that, mm -hmm. which is great, which is great. Yeah. So, so back to the uh, Uber acquiring Lime, you talked a bit about the last mile. What, what's your sort of ecological futurism for uh, well, we have the rail coming, but but just just for Lime alone, and and Lime are these little electric-powered scooter things. Right. Yeah. So, as you know, um, you know, I, I own two cab companies, and we're at a, a major battle with Uber and Lyft. Um, but I, you know, without getting too political, um, Uber and Lyft basically uh, says that they are uh, the answer to that last mile. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, Uber and Lyft, including taxis, uh, we still burn combustible engines mostly. Mm -hmm. um, we still have a lot of deadheading, right? So if I pick someone up, I drop someone off, I got to come back to pick another person up. Yeah. And that's yeah. dead, called deadheading when you're operating empty. And yeah. during so that an, whole... An example in here in Honolulu would be uh, uh, if somebody's in Waikiki, they want to be taken to the suburbs. No, that driver has to go all the way. He's not going to get any rides out in the suburbs. Right. He has to go all the way back to Waikiki again. So one of the th yeah. things is, and taxis never claim to be, um, you know, environmentally friendly mm -hmm. or that, that we're mm -hmm. part of that sustainability. We never claim that because it, it's essentially a lie, right? Because whether it's Uber or taxis, uh, we, we add to congestion, and I will tell you that if you get in your personal car and you go from point A to point B, right, and then you come back from point B to point A, mm -hmm. you will burn a heck of a lot less 
fuel and produce a lot less carbon mm -hmm. than if you were to have ridden an Uber or a taxi. Mm -hmm. Because that vehicle has to come back yeah. to pick up other people. And, and unless so they get super lucky and find another ride close to where they drop you off. Yeah, yeah, and that's, um, you know, doesn't happen all the time. It ha happens rarely, actually, yeah, because I, uh, most studies will show you that whether it's Uber or taxis, 50% of our uh, vehicle miles traveled or the miles mm -hmm. traveled is empty. Yeah, so, I, I have personal experience with that because I visit uh, Queens, New York very often mm -hmm. and I'm at the airport and the taxi driver says where and I say so and so Queens and you can just see him slump mm -hmm. because what he wants is a ride me to have go to Manhattan and all he has to do is drop me yep. off and look for somebody yep. waving and boom there's his next ride. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So for any um, you know whether it's Uber or whether it's taxis for them to uh, for us to uh, say that we are part of the solution mm -hmm. it's just simply not true. Mm -hmm. We are a reality that is necessary but we are an evil necessary mm -hmm. uh, uh, service. Um, but. Uh, Lime the, and, and electric scooters in general and electric bikes, mm -hmm. those are real solutions. And so that's why I'm excited about it. And quite frankly, I'm happy that Uber is investing in mm -hmm. that type of technology and helping it to grow. 350 million will really jumpstart Lime. Uh, another venture capital uh, group invested another 300 million into an a electric scooter called Bird. Uh, just a couple weeks ago. Hmm. So all same, this same principle as Lime. Same principle. Yeah. Same yeah. principle. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, I think they even use the same scooter made in China, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I mean, um, but yeah. So it's it's really exciting. Um, the, the 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 changes that are happening and and the, um, you know I I I commute on bikes everywhere. I mean, I commute every day and I do about 14, 15 miles a day, six days a week. Um, I do it for a multitude of reasons, but I don't see the last mile being an important thing. But I mean, I know that I'm in a, an exception, yeah. uh, that most people don't want to, and some people actually cannot, you know, uh, commute on bikes every day. I use my parents as a prime example. You know, they're in their 80s, they cannot, but they love riding the bus, but it is mm -hmm. sometimes challenging because that uh, proverbial last mile, which is not necessarily last mile, but even if it's couple hundred yards, whereas my dad is a cyclist too. Mm -hmm. He could get on a electric bike mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and go to the last 400 yards, Yeah, yeah right, yeah. or 200 yards or whatever mm -hmm. that may be. Um, so yeah, it's, we, we live in interesting times. And So in, in this case, by well, what about uh, for just for Lyme, your uh, typical tourist just wants to tootle around, maybe go from Waikiki to Diamond Head and back again. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the range of a, a lime is. But. Oh, the range of lime, from what I understand, is um, well, I don't know the exact range, but it's it can run all day, uh, do ten rides, and they I think they average uh, about a mile a day. So I'm sure it's like 15, 20 miles. Really? Yeah. So I'm just thinking of our proverbial tourist in Waikiki could easily go say to go around Diamond Head through Kahala to Kahala Shopping Mall mm -hmm. and then come uh, back again or maybe tour Kaimaki. Absolutely. Come back again. Uh, now, I mean, I, I would think that, again, it's it's about uh, trying to make it as convenient to everyone as possible. Mm -hmm. And so when we talk about multimodal transportation, I think e-scooters are different from e-bikes. Mm -hmm. So I, if, if I were to give a suggestion, you know, to a tourist and they said, I'm going to do that route that mm -hmm. you just suggested, I would say, get on an electric bike. Yeah because and it's much more that, comfortable and you can carry stuff and so on. Yeah, you have your little basket. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And on that cheery note, we need to take a break. Code Green Howard Wig. Back with David Jung in a minute. You can be the greatest, you can be the best. You can be the King Kong banging on your chest. You can beat the world, you can beat the war. You could talk to that dog banging on his door. You can throw your hands up, you can beat the clock. You can move a mountain, you can break rocks.
Good afternoon again. Welcome back. Howard Wig, Code Green with David Jung, libertarian or some offshoot of libertarianism extraordinaire. We've talked a lot about the transportation sector and electric bikes and the lime type of scooters as an alternate means of getting around when, again, I, I turn to tourists, but uh, it, certainly it could apply to, say, university students, uh, high school students, what, whatever. But you have some more thoughts on me getting my job done, and my job is to do everything I can to promote 100% clean energy, first electrical energy, and then we look at transportation energy, by 2045. What, what are your uh, thoughts on that? So, you know, I think I, when we spoke uh, first time, and I told you that I'm a libertarian and a conservationist at the same time, you saw that as sort of maybe not difficult to, uh, maybe not so in, not so compatible. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to sort of discuss that with you and present my side as sure, to why it is yeah. compatible and consistent. Um, you know, being a libertarian just merely means um, that uh, I'm for limited government and, uh, you know, uh, a limited set of rules and regulations to guide um, our community. But I'm not an anarchist. I mean, I do believe in rules and laws, mm -hmm. uh, and most libertarians do. Um, and I also believe, as most libertarians believe, that whatever rules and laws that we have must be strictly followed. That's just an ethical, moral issue, right? Mm -hmm. um, and we also recognize that we live in a society, and there are things that in which um, I cannot freely do what I want to do if, on a social contract basis, I've agreed that I will agree to whatever laws we all pass, even though I may not agree with it. And so as it relates to the environment, uh, because I do, for example, I am a conservationist. Yeah, well, you, I, I you, love uh, nature. I, I drive a car, you ride a bike, mm -hmm. my goodness. Yeah. Right, and, and that's by choice. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know that's part of my uh, ability to express my um, freedom, if you will, mm -hmm. as a civil libertarian. Um, but the one thing, one uh, thing that I wanted to sort of clarify is that um, I truly do believe that when it comes to uh, rules and regulations, that it is meant to help and um, protect those who can't protect themselves. I mean, that, that's one of the biggest values of agreeing as a society to live by rules and uh, rule of law, right? Absolutely, yeah. So, and I, I put uh, the environment as one as the environment can't protect itself, mm -hmm. but it's so essential to all of us. And so we need to have strict laws to, um, uh, to essentially force us, right, to mm -hmm. protect the environment. Mm -hmm. Now, where I differ a little bit with the environmentalists, um, you know, who are basically saying, well, you know, I wanna protect the environment for the sake of the environment, uh, I generally say, well, what's in it for us? as human beings, mm -hmm. how does it benefit us? Now, environment, the protection of environment has clearly been established, right? I mean, you may d d differ on the degree of climate change, but there's no escaping that human activity impacts on climate change. Mm -hmm. So from a libertarian standpoint, how do you get from here to there, you know, protecting the environment um, with the least amount of regulation? And for me, it is basically, um, and this is part of it is personality. Mm -hmm. You just lay the law down. I'll give mm -hmm. you an example. <clears throat> Plastic bags. Mm -hmm. You can sit there and try to incentivize people not to use plastic bags. You can use all kinds of, you know, subliminal messaging, and mm -hmm. you know, as many experts think that they can manipulate people into thinking in a certain way. No, the environment. Plastic is not good for the environment. Mm -hmm. So from this point on. Or you know you could set a set date and say no more selling of plastic bags mm -hmm. and everybody complies. Now where I have a problem is if they start taxing things because then that makes the government goes into the government coffer and and then you never see that money you know it gets spent in mysterious ways. But if legislation which basically tells you what you have to do and and, and it's not to fill the government coffer. 
I don't have a problem. You know, seatbelt, I mean, but that's not an environmental issue, but there are plenty of instances and examples in which, you know, the government basically, uh, we as a community have decided that the way to do it is just really establish the laws to, to help. Well, in, in the plastic bag, or I would <clears throat> add to that uh, paper bags, because paper bags involve chopping down trees, mm -hmm. uh, 15 cents. If you want a bag, you say, sure. I'll. And it goes into the supermarket or the market's uh, coffers. Right. And incidentally, the, all I've queried the checkout people at markets, I say, do you have an option? Yes, they can buy right there that reusable bag for 99 cents. Yeah. Boom, there it is. Yeah. And, and, and yeah. you know, you, you <clears throat> get uh, used to, I mean, I haven't used a bag in a long time. I mean, mm -hmm. I shop for myself. I don't shop for a family, so it's a little easier for me. But when I go to 7-Eleven, buy a bunch of drinks or whatever, I stuff it in my pocket mm -hmm. and everything else. Mm -hmm. But I don't, I don't ask for a bag. Yeah, yeah. I, I have infinite numbers of bags in the office, in the car, in the yeah. house. Yeah. yeah. So I'm always with a bag somewhere. So yeah. from a libertarian standpoint, mm -hmm. again, I may be a libertarian um, from the standpoint of I want less regulations, mm -hmm. and rules and regulations. But I'm not, I don't object to or oppose, uh, you know, well thought out rules and regulations that are intended to force us to do certain things like mm -hmm. help the environment. What about uh, carbon tax? That would, to reduce fossil fuel use, that would be the easiest of everything. Just tax carbon, figure out your formulas. So carbon tax is really complicated to me. I don't mm -hmm. fully understand it. And whenever you say tax, and then it's somehow monetized, and it, well, it goes into the mm -hmm. government's coffer somehow, mm -hmm. it, that automatically uh, puts a big yellow f flag for me. Mm -hmm. I think a simpler approach would be just to say, from this point on, you cannot have to Ford, GM, and everyone else. You must have hybrids or electric vehicles or whatever. Uh, your vehicles, average vehicles, uh, tra uh, average miles per gallon mm -hmm. must be this. Mm -hmm. and just set it and make them do it. Yeah, which we were doing for quite a while. Yeah. And even though we have more and more cars on the road in Hawaii, in America, the gasoline consumption is going down, down, down because your typical vehicle is much more efficient than it used to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So I, I don't have a problem of the government. Just uh, there's a lot of things that they dictate to to me on, or not me individually, but to companies. Right? Companies mm -hmm. are a little different. You know, they have uh, corporate citizenship duties and mm -hmm. and, and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So, um, but for um, you know the government to. And that's where I may differ with some of the uh, other libertarians. But uh, for me, the government telling companies that th you will achieve these thresholds or these, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't see a problem with that. Yeah, I mean, well, it's to help our envir environment. That directly impacts on my job. Uh, we work with Department of Energy, the federal department, and they set a minimum of efficiency ratios for air conditioners. Thou shalt not manufacture anything below this threshold. And uh, incandescent lamps were burned. The uh, manufacture of incandescent lamps was banned some years ago. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And as a result, even though we have more and more buildings, more and more homes, the per building uh, use energy use is going down, the per home energy use is going down. Yeah. Be because of regulations such, such as you're describing. Yeah. I mean, I think one of the things that we should be careful of is getting bogged down. You know, there's, in business, you know, you have this term, uh, uh, paralysis by analysis, right? Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. too often I see that, you know, where you could debate things ad nauseum and everything that you do from a legal standpoint when you rule, uh, pass rules and regulations could be seen as reg regressive because at the end of the day, it's the poor people that have less options. Mm -hmm. You know, but uh, unless it's something that's really like carrying a bag, I mean, you know, for a rich person, paying 15 cents is no big deal. For a poor person, paying 15 cents could be a big deal. Mm -hmm. But if you get bogged down by that alone and not seeing the bigger picture of really the, the positive impact that that rule can have on the environment, then, you know, that's what makes government so slow and inefficient. Mm -hmm. At some point, you just mm -hmm. gotta say, you know what, I've heard your arguments. We as a community, we decided we're just going to go. We're going to mm -hmm, do it. Mm -hmm.
Yeah. I, I can give many, many examples of that in, in my own professional career. Yeah. Where things really, really get bogged down, right? You know, I've, uh, uh, because I am a conservationist, um, I, I attend many of the city and state sponsored programs on mm -hmm. transportation. As you know, in our march to sustainability, we probably, transportation gets a D minus all the time. Mm -hmm. We're the worst, right? I mean, everyone else is meeting their uh, the, the goals except for transportation. So I attend these uh, programs and, I, and I'm, I probably won't be attending too many uh, uh, in the future because I just get frustrated because mm -hmm. all they do is talk, mm -hmm. you know? And when I, uh, the last, program we had, uh, I introduced myself and they asked for my sort of, you know, input on what the solution is. And I said, regulate. Mm -hmm. Just tell us what we have to do. Mm -hmm. tell, them, tell us at, at some point, no more diesel. Mm -hmm. Tell us at some point, no more combustible engine. <clears throat> and then we'll have to comply. Now, if you make that into where Roberts doesn't have a benefit over TPT or, in other words, people in the mm -hmm. same industry, where neither, they all have to comply. Yeah. There's no advantage, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if you start giving advantages, that's a different issue. You know, and that's what government sometimes does. But if it's across the board, sort of bright line, of this is by this time, we're not gonna have any more diesel gas. Mm -hmm. Well then, Roberts and everyone else will have to start getting ready for yeah, it. Yeah, it's a level playing field. It's a level playing field. Yeah. And uh, again, fuel efficiency standards, yeah. great, great example. There. And you can talk about, oh well then, I'm gonna have to raise prices and blah, blah, okay, whatever. I mean, well, you know. Except what, what they don't factor in is the laws of mass production. If a hybrid costs this much now, if suddenly you double and triple and quadruple the number of hybrids being manufactured, your per unit cost goes down, down, down. And that would be a benefit that, yeah. uh, um, but that's, it really doesn't matter. I mean, if, if it, even if you don't achieve that benefit, mm -hmm. you're still gonna do it. Mm -hmm. you know, that's where I, I think, you know, one of the things that mm -hmm. uh, I guess Trump, if you will, uh, is gaining some uh, positive response from certain people is, you know, he's, he's kind of like that, right? I mean, he's kind of a bully. Uh, bully. Oh, yeah. And he just kind of sets down the rules mm -hmm. and he says, just do it. And I think part of that is his, his business background. Because that's what CEOs generally do, right? Business owners generally do. Mm -hmm. I get my managers together. Tell me what, what you think. Blah, 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 blah. But, you know, at the end of the day, I got to make the decision. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to, boom, make the decision. Yeah. And, you know, um, if you're a good CEO, you the com company will benefit. If not, then the company will go bankrupt. But, but there is... Uh, this attitude of okay, I'm just going to decide, and you gotta. But that's one of the problems of government and even mm -hmm. some nonprofits, mm -hmm. right? You know, they they want to do good, but they can never pull the trigger. It's it's like they spend so much time talking to each other, yeah. talking about yeah, things, yeah, yeah. rather than just doing it. Mm -hmm. Well, we got maybe a minute left. I'll throw uh, air transportation out to you. That's the hardest one. Mm -hmm. The UAE, United Arab Emirates. They have come out with a new breed of plane which has zero windows. They have false windows and a camera pointed outside and you get an image of what's out there. And the benefit is that you reduce your fuselage weight by something like 40% and your uh, fuel efficiency goes way, way, yeah. way, way, way up. Yeah, I mean, un unfortunately for that, you know, international travel means that you go out of the boundaries of the United States. Mm -hmm. So it may be a little bit more difficult because the U.S.-based airlines will be at a competitive disadvantage if they have to use a, you know, that plane as opposed mm -hmm. to UAE or someone else or uh, Singapore Air, right? Uh, but maybe that is where international organizations come in, right? And you do it and say internationally everyone has to yeah. do it. If, right? if there's anything that's internationalized, it's the airline industry. Yeah. They have to be. Yeah. yeah. So you know what you know they do that with tort law, for example, if you have airplane accidents, you have mm -hmm. a uniform mm -hmm. international code. But they could do that with the uh, uh, the environment too mm -hmm. and sustainability and efficiency and all that. You know, we've still got a minute. Here's a controversial one, maybe uh, Jones Act. Your mm. take on the Jones Act. Yeah, I think Jones Act is another one of those things that you could debate all day long, but at the end of the day, common sense should prevail. Mm -hmm. The fact of the matter is that if it costs you twice, three times as much to go from California to Hawaii than it does to go from California to China, mm -hmm. 
there's something wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and who gets the brunt of that? Who pays for that? Us. Yeah. And unlike the 48 other states, and even Alaska, they have options. They can truck it, they can railroad it. We don't have that option. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm, you know, along with the fact that I am a libertarian and I believe this this gigantic Jones Act is, is, is very objectionable just by its... Uh, what it's trying to accomplish. I think the real cost to Hawaii um, is something that we should really uh, not only study. I mean, I, I, like I said, I don't like studying it. Mm -hmm. Just do it. Mm -hmm. Get rid of it. Repeal it. Mm -hmm. Or get, get us exempted. And it's sad that the four congressional delegations to Hawaii are probably the most uh, av strongest advocates. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're getting a little little pressure from. Yeah, I mean, if there's that, a litmus yeah. test for me as a voter, that's yeah. my litmus test. Mm -hmm. That's how strongly mm -hmm. I feel about the Jones Act. If you're going to sell us the community down the road for your benefit, so that you can get more money from the unions and so on, you know what? You shouldn't be in there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. Well, on that very cheery note, <laughs> we need to bid fond adieu to David Jung. A uh, libertarian extraordinaire, been a great, great, great conversation, David. This is Howard Wig, Code Green. See you next time.